Hello and welcome to the third day of the fall conference at the completed life initiative today. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Anita Hanning. She will help us to explore made 101. A guide to the path of the most resistance. Anita is a medical and cultural anthropologist. She's a graduate of Reed College. She did her doctoral work at University of Chicago. There, her research led her to spend hundreds of hours accompanying patients, families, and physicians on their journey through end-of-life options, in particular, medical aid in dying. In recent years, Hannig has emerged as the leading voice on death literacy in America. She's been interviewed by the Washington Post, USA Today, PBS, NPR, and the Boston Globe. In her award-nominated book, The Day I Die, The Untold Story of Assisted Dying in America, Hannig renders the stories of families and individuals making difficult and often heartbreaking choices to walk on what she calls the path of most resistance. Her work provides guidance for both the curious and those thoughtfully considering end of life options. Anita, welcome. We're so glad that you have joined us today. Thank you so much, Lynn, and thanks uh, to everyone who is joining the conference. And I can't wait to dive in with you. Great. Well, first, we'd like to thank you for the hundreds, probably thousands of hours now that you've dedicated to accompanying and walking alongside of individuals and families as they approach the end of their lives. And I can tell from the stories that you share in your book, from the stories of Ken and Joe, Doreen, Teresa and Bruce, just to name a few, that you really took the time to get to know each one of them. You were able to understand what inspired them, what frightened them, what brought peace, and what stirred anxiety. And you didn't just study or research them. You, you got inside their lives and learned what difficult decisions and circumstances they encountered. I really appreciated the dedication you demonstrated to tell their stories. First, I'd like to ask, uh, you're a cultural and medical anthropologist. So tell us about that work. What does a cultural and medical anthropologist do? Yes. Um, so I think most people who hear the word anthropologist, if they know anything about the discipline at all, they might just think bones and archaeology. And that's some of what anthropologists do, but that's not what I do. That's not what cultural and medical anthropologists mainly do. So we study culture in all its fascinating and diverse forms. And specifically, medical anthropology looks at how looks at the cultural facets of health and healing, of conceptions around bodies, of ideas around de death and dying. Um, so medical anthropologists might study how culturally applicable organ transplants are, the way people look at birth, the way people look at death. Um, so all of those things that are not human universals and that really have to do with how we're brought up, what we are believed, um, what we believe thinking as we grow up and all of those types of things. And that's where um, medical anthropologists come in. Thank you. You mentioned in your book, the statistic that 60% of Americans die in, in hospitals, frequently in an ICU care unit, and really with very little to say about how they are going to die. But you also point out that much of the other 40% at some point come to the end of a long line of failed treatment options, and they are designated as terminal by their physician. What happens next for most Americans in that situation? That's a great question. So from the people that I encountered during my research, I think once they had gotten that kind of prognosis from a physician and it was clear that either the treatments that they're being offered were not um, available to them or they didn't want to do them or, they're, or they weren't offered any more treatments because there were no treatments to be offered, they really kind of felt a little abandoned, some of them. 
because next came some really hard decisions around who in the family could take on their care, if anybody. Um, would they have to move to an assisted living facility or a nursing home? Um, when would they enter hospice? Um, and in order to qualify for hospice, you have to have a um, life expectancy of around six months. Um, which often then means once you enter hospice that you have a new um, team of physicians, your old physician usually will not continue to be a physician. So you encounter a new care team and um, you have to face some hard decisions around whether or not what what the end of your life is going to look like. Um, are you going to find all the support you need in hospice? A lot of people are, um, but some people don't. Is your family going to be supportive of you? Are you... Do you need to bring in other supports, other support systems? And to what degree do you want your pain and your your pain managed or the symptoms of your um, of your illness managed? To what degree do you want to be sedated when things get really bad? Um, or d is it more important to you to have this real clarity um, as you're approaching the end of your days to understand what is happening to you? So those are some really tough choices that people make and in that equation, in in those, when, when we look at kind of what are the choices that people have, we're now in a situation where for 22% of all Americans, they do have one additional choice when they consider all their options at the end of life, and that's medical aid and dying. And it's, um, I should say that technically that choice is now being opened up to more Americans because Oregon and Vermont just removed their residency requirements. So technically anybody from a different state could theoretically move to Vermont or move to Oregon um, in order to complete an assisted death. Practically, it's still very difficult because not only is it extremely difficult to move while you're so sick and have the financial resources to do that, but also you have to establish some sort of care in your new state. You have to, even if you don't move there permanently, because you have to take the medications inside the state borders. And you have to, and, and it's unclear right now um, whether or not you need to establish hospice in that new state. And just think of all the logistical um, things that have to fall into place for you to um, pick up, move. I mean, medical transport alone can be extremely expensive and move to a state that allows us to dying. And of course, there's um, voluntary stopping and eating and drinking. That's an option for people who don't live in a state that has assisted dying laws. And um, there are other things that people might consider, but one in five Americans now has legal access to a medically assisted death. Thank you. You've lived all over the United States. You went to college in Oregon and did graduate work in Chicago, and you taught at Brandeis outside of Boston, and currently you're in Germany. Uh, you've had the opportunity to study and observe many cultures. How would you describe the unique approach in the United States uh, towards the topic of death and dying? Yeah, I mean, I think it it depends, right? It depends where in the States you are. And um, I don't want to paint too, with too, brush, too broad of a brush stroke here, but generally speaking, I think there's a little bit of a discomfort and avoidance around this idea of death and dying in the States. And some of that has to do with the fact that most Americans can live pretty much their entire lives without seeing a dead body or really um, anybody who's dying because we've outsourced almost everything when it comes to dying. So we've outsourced um, the medical treatment. Um, most people die in hospital. You already, in hospitals, you already mentioned that, 60%. Um, we've outsourced what happens to funeral remains, right? You have professionals that come in and whisk the body away when somebody dies. Um, and then everything that happens afterwards is also really not in the under the auspices of the family anymore, like it used to be. I mean, it's possible there are uh, there's a cultural movement to reclaiming that kind of um, uh, natural death care and uh, and um, kind of a home style funeral and things like that. But that's that's the exception. So um, I think most of us are not very um, open to talking about death, or at least until recently. I think some of that is now changing. Um, 
and 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 we're surrounded by so many fantasies of immortality um on a daily basis and um more things are coming out now with ai i'm thinking about ghost spots or like digital avatars of the deceased that really um, allow for somebody to live their life without ever thinking that death is a reality. Um, or our, our cult around youthfulness, anti-aging campaigns and all of those things mean that you really don't have to face death until it hits close to home. And, um, and I think that kind of attitude really does people a disservice at the end of the day because it means they are not left with any meaningful time or even the tools to investigate their own mortality. Is there a country or culture that you think has a healthy approach to death? I don't want to um, overly stylize or overly generalize or uh, fall into the cliche of saying Buddhism, but it is <laughs> Buddhism mm -hmm. for me because there are many, I mean, there are many um, different groups of Buddhists. I mean, there are so many different kinds, but I um, I'm, I'm familiar with some Buddhist approaches to death where people spend an entire lifetime preparing for the end of life, where they spend intentional time contemplating their mortality. So think about meditation, right? Th even think about um, uh, uh, yoga practices in Hinduism, right? This idea of the corpse pose or ideas around um, taking your lifetime to spend at least some of your lifetime preparing for death. And right now we spend like zero or percent, 0.5 percent preparing for death. I mean, think about even um, our culture around advanced, uh, advanced care directives um, is, is not what it should be. We don't really spend very much time thinking about it, much less preparing for it. And even if you have an advanced care directive, it doesn't mean that you've really prepared in any other way. I mean, we spend our entire life amassing possessions and then hope that our the people who come after us will sort through all those things. Um, but we don't really live with an eye towards our mortality most of the time, I would think. Um, and that's quite different from some of the Buddhist approaches I've read about, where even at the end, um, people who are close to death really spend a lot of time intentionally, intentionally dissolving all of the attachments that they've built throughout their lifetime and intentionally start giving away their possessions, amassing only the people and the few things that they that they want to have an eye on when they go, and so that they can feel like nothing is keeping them back and nobody's clinging to them, and they're not clinging to anything. Um, and I think that's really a beautiful sentiment. So this idea that you can just let go at the end of life when it's time. Thank you. Uh in your book, The Day I Die, you begin with the story of Ken. Ken had a, a failing heart, and you wrote that he said, I'm more afraid of living than dying. Uh, what drew you to Ken's story? So, um, Ken was a real character. So, he had just turned, oh, he was turning 90 while I met him. He wasn't interested in um, swimming with, along with the crowd. He wanted to do his own thing when he wanted to do it and how he wanted to do it. And um, even though he had so many physical ailments and he did actually have quite a bit of pain and um, he was really eloquent about why he felt like it wasn't worth it for him to stick around. So, I mean, and I should, frame that in saying he did already have a terminal prognosis. His um, physician had said that he didn't think Ken would make it past in the next six months. And so there was part of him that was very realistic about what was happening. And, um, but he also really wanted to go out with a big bang is the feeling I got. <laughs> and so um, we became close and when it was time for him to go, he had scheduled his death for I think it was Memorial Day weekend and he had invited me and his family members and, you know, the, the, a doctor from End of Life Choices Oregon and a volunteer and his caregiver, Sarah. And um, he had, um, he had just turned 90 and so everybody got there and it was still, it was just still the feeling that he had just had his birthday. He wanted to make it to 90. He did make it to 90. 
and and people were there to see him off and um when it i mean and he almost treated the whole thing as as kind of like a living memorial to him and so he had ordered all this food and he was offering people sandwiches and drinks and telling stories and peddling off his paintings and um and of course there was something so bittersweet about those moments right you're sitting in the living room with somebody um, and you're very, very aware that an hour from now, this person will no longer be around. And, um, and when it came time for him to die, I remember he had moved into the, into the, the bedroom by himself with his niece and his niece, no, no, I'm sorry, his granddaughter. And they were spending some time together. And um, then he called for the rest of us. And he was a blues musician all his life. And he had actually given me a copy of his record um, for me to keep, I still have it. And he, his, one of his sons was cueing um, one of the songs from the record, which was called Nothing About the Blues. And um, I think the lines were something like, don't care if I win or I lose, you know, uh, I don't know nothing about the blues. And so he, he was um, singing along to the song as he was leaving, as he was going. So he was singing along to his own voice and he took the drink and um, the volunteer had put a straw into it. And at the time, second all was still available. So he, um, he we had emptied the capsules before um, in the kitchen and um, it was this like really thick milky drink. And Dariana had put a straw in it because it is so incredibly bitter that it, it just takes your breath away. Um, previously in the kitchen, I tried a little bit just to see what it tastes like and it's, it was disgusting. And so he took the drink um, and, but he immediately wanted the straw out. He was like, I don't, I don't, I don't need the straw. He, um, and Dariana told me later, well, that's because a lot of men refuse straws, you know, it's just unmanly somehow. And so he, I, I expected him to um, not be able to get it down because it is so incredibly repulsive. And he just put it, um, put it back and then asked for a chaser with some, I think it was like some fireball and Coke <laughs> and um, chase that down. And um, meanwhile, kept singing along to his song and people in the room were just kind of like, what do we do? This is unprecedented. How do we act now? And, but there really wasn't very much time. He had, I think two or three minutes before he um, fell asleep and um and he had this epitaph that he had written previously that he had shared with me. And um, after he had drank in the, the, the cocktail, he starts citing off, citing the, reciting the epitaph. Um, do you want me to read it to you? Sure, I, still I love have it. Yeah, it. I actually he didn't, it out too. It's beautiful. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't make it through all the way. I didn't say that in the book because I wanted people to read the whole epitaph, but he, he didn't read the whole thing. Oh, he, he didn't read it. He memorized it, um, but I'll, I'll read it to you. Yeah, I love that. Um, so he said, walking on eggshells, hanging by a thread, not really living, not really dead. I'm all used up, nothing left to give. All my time is spent just trying to live. That's why I've chosen not to be and let the world turn minus me. And um, yeah, I, um, it was surprising then how quickly he kind of fell asleep and um the the his sons put him on the bed um like laid him down and his his uh, dog jumped on his lap and the rest of us left the room to give the family some privacy and i want to say i'd have to check um i think it was 10 minutes later or something the physician and went back inside there and we followed just to check and um and he had already passed so it was um, very quick. I mean, his heart was so sick. And so with people who have um, real heart problems, they tend to go pretty quickly. And um, I mean, the family was really sad and so at the same time in such awe and so grateful and just so grateful about being able to say goodbye and not having to wonder, you know, will I miss, um, um, you know, when will I see my dad the last time? Will I have not said everything that I needed to say and all of those types of things? So um, I think they were really grateful and I'm still in touch with one of his sons now. We write every once in a while just to see how it's going. And of course he's, he's 
he said, I mean, whenever you lose a parent, it's, um, it can feel incredibly tragic and there is that loss, but for him, he kept saying the loss isn't complicated by, by his absence or by not thinking that he hadn't done enough or, or all those types of things. Um, yeah. Yeah. For those listening, the, um, the book, the, uh, day you die, Anita begins with the story of Ken and it's very, uh, it's just a beautiful rendering and very dynamic. And you get a sense of who he is and, um, the power and the peace and the comfort and the joy that surrounded him that day as he, uh, read his own epitaph and, uh, sang his own music that he'd recorded with his sons. It was just a, a, a wonderful entry into the topic that you explore um, in the beginning chapters of the book. So um, I wanted to make sure everybody had the opportunity to hear yeah. his story. Yeah, and I, um, and I think I thank you for s summarizing it this way, because I, I don't, I'm not sure that came across and how I was t describing it, but there was a real sense of relief and joy and i don't mean relief in the sense oh my god i'm so glad he's gone but a relief in the sense oh my god he really wanted this this is how he wanted to go and he was joking up until the very last moment he and it didn't mean that he thought of life as expendable i think that's sometimes from people from the outside who don't really who haven't been there who don't really understand how these deaths can go um the lightheartedness doesn't take away from the weight of this decision or from Ken knowing exactly what he was about to do, but it means that people can join in the joy of the fact that someone's suffering is over and that this person gets to have a, a choice at the end of not that they die because they are going to die. It's very imminent, but how they're dying and the course of how that goes, what they're wearing, what they can say to people and and of course, sometimes if you're lucky, um, everybody can be there at the end, um, but not always. So, so I, yeah, I think those moments, um, of course they are sad. They're, they always said I was crying. Everybody there was crying, but at the same time, there's a real levity, um, or there can be a levity to somebody's loss. It, it just so depends on the family. It depends on the situation. Um, but I would say, I mean, in the family, I think was at the end, they had really made their peace with the fact that Ken was dying. And, um, and that's important. It's really important for the family to be on board if, if they can find it in themselves. Well, some might assume that opting for medical aid and dying is the um, easier option. Uh, you call it the path of most resistance what what makes you say that yeah i mean it's really not an easy path to choose and i don't don't even mean that emotionally or mentally even just logistically and practically so i met patients who spent months trying to find physicians willing to participate in the law especially in rural areas of the state uh, in conservative areas of the state where um, often the only health system in town was Catholic. And if that hospital has a, has a policy against assisted dying, then none of the doctors can participate. Um, so you have to be a little savvy to find physicians who are willing to participate. There is, um, there's so many other hurdles. So if you no longer live at home, which a lot of people are not, Ken was no longer living at home. He was living at an assisted living facility. A lot of those facilities have um, practices, uh, sorry, practices, have policies against um, assisted dying. So there have been cases I describe, I think one in the book where people have to go to a motel to die. Um, now there are, I mean, I know this sounds really strange, but there are Airbnbs in states like Vermont and Oregon and California that say, or maybe not advertise the fact that you can go die there, but they, they, they say they're open to hosting um, people for their end of life ceremonies. And um, also hospice, right? There are some hospices who refuse to cooperate with a patient's wish to seek an assisted death. And some of them are neutral. Um, most, most hospices 
um, their hospice nurses are not allowed to be present at an assisted death. So they can support a patient kind of generally, but when it comes time to the assisted death, they can't be in the room or they can't be in the house. Um, and up until somewhat recently, there was also um, a little bit of a barrier when it comes to the medications. Um, the formulas have, I'm not going to go into this now, I talk about this more in the book, but the formulas have changed over the years and there have, there have been times when assisted deaths have taken a long time and there have been a handful of times when people have woken up again. Extremely rare, hasn't happened in years now, um, but that creates an additional barrier. But I want to say overall, besides those barriers, there is a sense that people who are already too sick can't use the law. And what I mean by that is that because you have to be able to self-administer the lethal medications, um, so either um, orally by drinking it or by pushing a plunge on your feeding tube or a rectal catheter, you have to have use of your hands or and or be able to swallow. Um, some patients with advanced neurodegenerative conditions don't have the use of either. They can't swallow or they can't use their hands. And so people are experimenting with eye recognition software and things like that, but it has happened that people are shut out of the law if they can't physically self-administer the lethal medications. So that creates an additional barrier. So if you think about it, these laws were written for people who are terminally ill, but people who are too sick really can't use them. Or they can, but they will be running into some issues. Um, and then of course, people who don't quite meet the six month requirement also can use the law, right? Sometimes it's hard to say, oh, you have a year left or you have six months. Somebody who has a year left is not eligible. Somebody whose physicians think has, you know, six months is eligible. And of course it's important to have these um, criteria in place, but sometimes there are some gray areas there. In your writing, you remind us that language matters. And uh, what are you, what do you think are the best words to describe a good death? Mm. I think a good death is so personal to whoever is um, involved because for some people it may be really important to die in a hospital and be surrounded by that kind of expertise or that kind of ability to intervene if possible or keep them comfortable or what have you. So I would never personally say, oh, an assisted death or a good death has to be an assisted death, for instance, or um, cause it's, it really depends on, on your values. I can, t I can say that the, for me personally, the deaths I've seen that I would describe as good, if we can say that a death is good, um, have been just really uneventful, peaceful, um, quiet and kind of with a sense of resolution, I would say like a sense of this is the time, this is the space or the place. Nobody's clinging, nobody is um, is kind of feeling completely bereft. Like there's a, there's a sense in which one of the characters in my book described it in you're closing that book. You're closing that book and you're letting go and you're helping the person who's dying let, let go. I think it's it's this idea of surrendering to something that we don't know what comes after the dying. We have no idea. Um, and just absolute radical surrender to that idea and um, and kind of the absence of fear to me. Um, and and just knowing that whatever world you leave behind is going to go on without you. Oh, that's beautiful and powerful and inspiring and challenging all, all at once. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm not sure who said this, but uh, I did along the way. Uh, I saw the quote that you are the leading voice in uh, death literacy in America. Um, I'm wondering what you're doing now, where, what your research uh, is involving, what kind of work you're doing after um, the publication of your last book? I actually have been doing some really fun things. I am collaborating with producers at PBS um, on writing 
episodes for their new YouTube series, Dead and Buried, which um, looks at contemporary uh, approaches to death and dying and um, kind of geared towards a younger generation. It's uh, PBS, uh, PBS Voices uh, Digital Studios is the um, is the series, and um, it's been really incredibly rewarding. It feels very applicable. We just finished an episode on grief. We're having one come out on the right to die later in the season, and we're doing one on our digital footprint after we die, which is also very interesting. Um, so I'm doing that. I'm doing. I'm working as a freelance writer. Um, that's mostly what I'm doing, trying to establish myself in that vein. Great. Well, we look forward to that series and to your future work. Um, in your book, you not only talk about the deaths of Ken and Joe and Doreen and Eva and Bruce, but you tell us a lot about their lives. Our organization is called the Completed Life Initiative, and our founder, Faith Summerfield, believed uh, that how we live and how we die are intrinsically connected. So borrowing from one of your words, she understood that as one curates a good death, that's your word, I thought was very um, thoughtful. Um, as one curates a good death, one will often live intentionally and purposefully towards completing their plans and their relationships. Uh, in your observation of good lives, what are the habits or characteristics of those who live into a completed life? Mm. I think that's an excellent question. So the people I can mostly speak to people whom I've met in the course of my work on assisted dying, but I think what united all of them is that they had come to a real space of acceptance about their mortality. They were no longer in denial about what was coming and they really looked to their own passing with a sense of completion. And what I mean by that is that they no longer really had the sense that they had to travel to other countries or they had to um, finish this book or um, scale this mountain or do this or this. They all had kind of the sense of, you know, I've done a lot of really cool things in my life and I don't, I, and a lot of them actually at the time said, I wish I were here to witness the next election because they were so curious what would happen. Um, but they really, they had really, I mean, and they, of course they had regrets, you know, they had things that they would have done differently, but they currently really didn't have urging pressing projects anymore. Um, they were leaving that to the next generation and, you know, many of us associate this moment with the word terminal. We used it earlier, you know, um, in the discussion, but in my experience, these endings were also a form, a form of liberation. Um, and what I mean by that is that those people were looking towards an unknown horizon and, and it takes real courage to to tread a path that, you know, you don't know what's going to be on the other side and to make quote unquote friends with death, but that's what they were doing. And, and I think that's a powerful message to think about, okay, um, you know, so much of our lives, we think about quantity. We think about, oh, is this person going to live to 100, 110, or we, you know, we celebrate anniversaries or it's so much in the numbers, but really you know, at the end of the day, they were just interested, like the, the people that I worked with were like, okay, like realistically, what is my quality right now? How can I make the most out of this quality that I have and not be obsessed about how much longer I'll be here, but how I'm gonna be here? Um, and I have to say there's a real grace in, in kind of stemming this cultural tie towards longer, um, you know, longer, better, you know, um, and, and wanting to do more and, 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 and optimize our lives and just say, you know what? Okay, I'm done. I'm complete. I look at my life and I'm sure there are things I would do differently, but I, um, I no longer will get to, and that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's, uh, you know, 
at the completed life initiative, we are always uh, as focused on life as how we die and uh, wanting to cultivate uh, practices that um, embrace or healthily surrender as you used um, our, to the uh, fact that we all will die, but that that should inform how we live and the quality of the life that we uh, carry with us. And so uh, I think that that was just a, a beautiful uh, uh, challenge and uh, inspiring words for how uh, we can live into completed lives. So thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you being a guest with us today and for giving us your time and your expertise. And we will uh, continue to look for future work that you're involved in, particularly the PBS series. And uh, as always, I would encourage anybody that has not picked up uh, Anita's book to pick that up. It's just a great uh, landscape of uh, lives that are considering end of life options and what uh, options are available to you and what um, advanced directives and forethought needs is required. So thank you, Anita. Uh, have a wonderful day and we'll look forward to your next series and our next opportunity to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. And thanks everyone.